Hello and welcome to Bangalore International Center's very own podcast BIC Talks. Bangalore International Center is a platform for informed conversations, exchange of ideas and a space for arts and culture. BIC Talks brings the essence of all that the physical space stands for and more to your doorstep. Where are you from? What is your native? It is impossible to live in India and not face this question routinely. Where we are born, where we live and where we grow up are tied to our identity either by ourselves or by those around us. Journalist, scriptwriter and author Annie Zaidi explores this and more in her latest award-winning book Bread, Cement, Cactus: A Memoir of Belonging and Dislocation. Hi, I'm Pavan Srinath and Annie, welcome to BIC Talks. Thank you, Pavan. Anchoring our conversation today is returning guest host Purna Swami. Purna is an independent writer and journalist who was here last on episode 28 to talk to Rahul Rao about the politics and the morality of taking down problematic historical statues. Welcome back Purna and the metaphorical floor is yours. Thanks so much Pavan it's good to be back. So Annie it's great to be interviewing you again after I think 4 years and I thought I'd begin by asking you about the process of writing this book. Quite simply what compelled you to tackle this question about home and how did you put the book together it's quite distinctive in that it combines memoir and reportage and you had reported earlier in your career from some of the places you cover so yeah could you tell me a little bit about how you actually constructed this book hello purna this book comes out of prize i had applied for the nine dots prize which is a relatively new prize the way they do these things is that they pose a question and that question is something that they believe is of contemporary importance across the world so the question for last year was can one say that there's still no place like home and i have for a long time been writing in brief ways in tentative ways about questions of identity and belonging even in my first book known to the whole book isn't about that but there are sections and chapters which are about what i thought about where i belonged and and the ways in which i felt i didn't belong and the struggle to try and understand who you are make sense of the landscape and the culture these are just things that i've been struggling with i think for a long time maybe since childhood not consciously just subconsciously so the moment i saw the question I, this was something i knew i wanted to try at least But also a couple of years before this i had been wanting to write something about my childhood this place where i grew up i i where well, you know you grow up where you grow up and you don't pay much attention to how that is different from other people's upbringing if it's good it's good if it's not so good you try and forget it but the place itself was not something i gave much thought to until after i became a journalist and when i started to meet other writers and people would say really that's so unusual and i would say oh is that unusual and then after a while i started to think yeah actually that's pretty unusual and coming at it as a journalist then you have to also think about what made it what it was it wasn't enough to say that it's just different from a city or a town how is an industrial township different from both an urban landscape and a rural and every other kind of landscape and what makes it that way so in the course of just having all these thoughts i started to kind of look back and then i went back to look at the same place with grown up eyes and kind of have conversations with people about what place means what displacement means so as you attempt to answer this very difficult question about can we still say that there is no place like home you begin with physical spaces and physical sites but then you always work your way into the history of people whether it's the bheel community outside the township you grew up in or the history of your own family in up but i must admit that some of my favorite parts of the books were when you actually dealt with the idea of home spatially as a physical landscape like the hills of rajasthan or the sangam of rivers in the city of your birth allahabad and 
At that point, I was reminded of a question that the historian Paul Carter asks, and that is, what was a place like before it was named? That's to say, before it was marked by a history of people. So I was wondering, how have you come to think about landscape, you know, unmarked landscape in relationship to your notion of home? I don't know if I've come to think of unmarked landscape, the quote that you mentioned about it being an unnamed place. I don't know if I could have an emotional relationship with an unnamed place, which is not to say that other people can't. I find it personally a little bit difficult. You know, one of the things that I've always found a little strange about my experience is that, like you've read in the book, I grew up in a fairly isolated place, a very small community, and we did often go up in the hills and and there was a lot of nothingness around in the landscape. And yet, when I go to another country or different corners of my country, but especially abroad, if you go to say, places like Australia or even parts of the United Kingdom, I have often felt myself being quite frightened. And this is something I find very difficult to explain. Uh, For instance, the first time I went to the United Kingdom, it was on a scholarship, and I just decided to take a long walk. And uh, barely, I think, less than two miles out of the campus, I found myself getting extremely nervous, and I couldn't understand why. And then I realized it's because there were no people, just nobody, not one soul. And in India, coming from India, even if you're in a rural area, even if you're not living in a busy, thriving, hubbing kind of atmosphere like Mumbai or Bangalore, there's always somebody. You walk five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you will find a human being and you are able to stop that human being and you can ask that person, what is this place? Where am I? And when I don't have that, when I walk half an hour and there's nobody to stop and ask, where am I? What is this place? I don't know what to do with it. And uh, I have never thought of myself as a very social person, as a very you know people-friendly person. But I think unnamed, unpeopled landscapes are something that some part of me recognizes as hostile. I feel very lost and I don't think I'd like to be there. You begin your book by using this quote, but an Urdu translation of it from Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. A person does not belong to a place until someone beloved is buried there. And then later in the book, you say, I shut my eyes and try to conjure a place of safety, a place where I can go as I am. What I see is a cluster of graves. And it's a very dark thought in some ways to think about being home in death. And you keep returning to this idea often. And I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about that, about being home in death? And also then, how does that differ from being at home when we are living? So other people tell me it's morbid. I always think that there's nothing morbid about death, particularly. I have always found graveyards very restful. Even before I started thinking about any of these things, I have never thought of them as frightening places. I didn't feel any particular affinity for them either until my grandparents died. I think what what Marcus said when I first came upon that sentence, it didn't mean anything to me. I read Marcus years ago and, you know, that sentence didn't strike me as anything at the time. But I had been thinking for the last few years about, you know, where do I belong And ultimately also about not only where you want to live, but where do you want to live when you're close to the end of your life? That question sort of became a little important to me a few years ago. Because as you grow older, especially if you're thinking that, okay, do I want to ever buy a house or will I just rent? Will I move every 11 months on a a new lease? Or will I ever have my own place? And then if you think of that question, then the other bigger question is, Is it going to be the kind of place where I will live unto the end of my days? And when you think end of days, then you are forced to think about, is this going to be a place where you have family? Is this going to be the place where if something happens to you, not only the question about finding a sense of home when you're living, one of the big factors for almost everybody is to be near family and friends because 
not only the joy they bring to your life and and the ways in which you can contribute to their lives but also if you are ever in trouble will there be somebody you can count on and finally if you die will someone know what to do with you will you feel okay dying in a strange completely a place where nobody knows you and i think that question made me think a little harder about where i wanted to go how i felt about where i am i think for me because i was very attached to my grandparents and because i derive my um, identity not just my social identity but my personal identity you can even say some part of my political identity from that side of the family and particularly from my grandparents so i wanted to be near them but now that they're gone i can't be near them in life but it does occur to me that i would like to be near them in death at least and that question i find is for anyone particularly for people who bury people this question is very important people do write in their wills it is a way of not only testifying to where you would like to die but also it's also a way of testifying to what your life has been what your vision has been what your affections have been who you considered beloved in your life i think of that not in a dark way partly because of this because for me those graves represent love they do not represent any kind of finality they represent continuity you talk about people who have a culture of burial deriving a sense of home or of place through those practices and through certain rituals but you also through this book negotiate an identity that isn't so easy to explain and what you end up doing in looking at your own personal identity which is multi faceted you end up looking at the idea of nation and i was wondering did you ever resist dealing with this idea of patriotism as you were tackling these very personal questions of who am i and where do i come from patriotism is one thing it is difficult to resist in a personal way without also resisting politically i'm one of those people who grew up feeling very patriotic and feeling like that was the right way to be all the deshbhakti songs i knew them all by heart i still do and i felt the love of my country in a very visceral way and in many ways i continue to feel that the love of the landscape itself the idea of india is something that is deeply emotional for me however i think particularly because of having a clearer understanding of what nationhood means and how borders change uh, when i was growing up i didn't really even think very much about the fact that your idea of what a country is can change and then when you think back but you know india was partitioned and not so very long ago like just within living memory so to speak and to then identify with one particular piece of land and completely deny and become hostile to the same piece of land that was once what you could have called your country once or what your ancestors would have called your country once to feel nothing but hostility for it it just started to feel like a slightly troubling idea all these thoughts were kind of in my head when i was writing the book and i found that it is impossible to think of india without thinking also of partition because even now even the most nationalist even the most kind of you know flag waving i will even say intolerant kind of nationalists out there their sense of who they are is actually not just defined by who they are but is also defined by the other their other is very important to them and then of course with the ca and nrc then the question became even more urgent and pertinent because not only was there the question of where the national borders are but also the question of who can be othered within these borders so all of these things were playing in my head and i won't say that i found any easy kind of resolution to any of these questions the questions remain in my head and for all of us in the country i think but i do think that there is a bit of a problem with the way patriotism is understood particularly for young people we are taught not to question anything at all including 
and particularly on this question of nationalism and patriotism that if somebody out there has said that if you're a patriot you cannot question this if you're a patriot you cannot question anybody else who claims to also be a patriot none of that makes any sense because if everybody says they're a patriot then everybody gets to question everybody else or nobody does speaking of these divisions uh, another kind of division that you really focus on is language you talk about the historical ruptures of hindi and urdu before and after partition and you also talk about your own journey of learning urdu uh, as an adult and you know finding a new definition of home through that i was wondering if you could speak a little bit about this idea of language and it's withering you know because when languages are erased so are certain political imaginations of home and who belongs to a particular home yes absolutely you're right in fact uh, this question of erasure is is today is a good week to talk about it because just the other day i saw something about how dehradun has been renamed partially somebody had tweeted a picture of dehradun railway i think the words painted and they were also written in the urdu text english hindi and urdu text and now that's been changed so the urdu is gone and dehradun has been written as dehradunam which is in the sanskrit style which is weird uh, certainly and it reminds me once again about the reason why i had to put in the language chapter in the book i hadn't thought that i would initially it wasn't part of my plan when i first wrote out the book proposal i didn't think that i would write a chapter on language but when i started to think for instance about my own life here in mumbai i moved here two decades ago it's where i've lived the longest now here lots of people who are not from mumbai in the sense i mean who is from mumbai anyway it's a relatively new city 90% of its population has come from somewhere within the last two or three generations but this question of who belongs and who doesn't was finally decided by language and there was a lot of hostility about 10 years ago that has kind of died down now aimed at north indian hindi speakers because of that question it was only in coming to mumbai that i found that i was being identified as a hindi speaker and therefore i had to also identify myself as a hindi speaker but the problem is that one cannot easily identify as a hindi speaker also because i am actually not the hindi speaker that the hindi speakers of a certain kind want me to be i am apart from being muslim i also come from an urdu heritage and i do not speak the hindi that the, the official hindi so to speak you know which is they injected a whole lot of sanskrit in it and the injection of sanskrit into hindi has been a political project and if you go back and read some of the arguments around hindi in the early part of the 20th century starting from you know the late 19th century up until independence there was this concerted movement to separate hindi and urdu and this is something that i refer to in the book hindi writers including you know very well known ones like makhanlal chaturvedi they had pointed out that this is politically motivated and and they had said that this is something that one should not encourage you know they're putting more and more sanskrit into hindi and putting more and more persian into urdu because he had said and i quote this in the book as well that this would give legitimacy to the demand for pakistan because you kind of in rejecting urdu and in saying that the urdu script has no place in india if you start to say that then you're effectively saying that anybody who inhabits that language anybody who is familiar with that script should not feel at home in india indirectly that is what you're saying and i think that is exactly what happened that the demand for the separation of the two languages was ultimately linked to the separation of two communities and then it became the two nation theory also in many other ways if you go back to some of the debates i was watching the wonderful series that has been written uh, about the constitution the debates around the constitution which was funded by rajya sabha tv 
and in that series there is a segment on languages too and then i went back and i checked about that again and it is true that when there was a demand by certain indigenous groups for their own language and the speakers were many in the million and they demanded that our languages santali murmu other languages you know other tribes they wanted their languages to be represented in the constitution as distinct languages but they didn't have their own scripts because they were oral mostly and so that those demands were not accepted and acknowledged and i think in the denial of the language was also the denial of the culture the denial of a people's right to live in the way that they deem fit and which they consider is valuable every time you efface a language every time you create conditions that are hostile to a language or a script as is being done for urdu today uh, you are kind of also destabilizing people and their any community that associates itself with that language considers itself familiar to that language you know there is a bond there that people feel with the language you also efface those people and their rights in a country it's not just language though right uh, in your book you talk a lot about being a woman and how gender also creates these frictions around home not just as a conceptual idea but also as a very tangible physical space at one point you write i grew into womanhood with a feeling of dispossession the implication being that if you cannot inhabit your body with ease how can you inhabit home easily and i thought that was a, a very insightful point so could you tell me a little bit about how you negotiated your identity as a woman and finding home i think this question while it is pertinent to me actually this is something that i wouldn't have thought of myself as something that was of urgent importance in the context of home and belonging again this chapter also was not something that i had initially thought of as in my book proposal i wasn't thinking of gender at all i was just thinking of location and region but when i started to research the book i started traveling i started asking other people about what they thought about things and more than one woman said that you know they'd always kind of begin with saying oh how interesting the subject is very interesting and then they would say yeah but you know it's different for women and then i started to think about it and said it's absolutely true the women who said this were married women of course so for married women this internal tussle of where home really is and what home means and where they feel they actually belong in an emotional way is a very pertinent one and i hadn't thought about it because i hadn't yet been forced to leave and i hadn't been forced to leave my natal family if i move i move of my own free will and i hadn't had to make the difficult kind of transition from identifying with two sets of families and from having to choose i think a lot of married women have to make this choice on a daily weekly yearly basis if you have one month vacation for instance are you going back to your own parents or are you going to visit your husband's parents and if you already live with those parents will you have to take their permission and how many times a year will that permission be granted these are things that for indian women and i think maybe i can say south asian women questions are of uh, uh, very urgent importance and they they overshadow everything else they overshadow regional maybe they even overshadow religious identity because if you do not have the permission to even go visit your own parents or if you need to explain it which i think most indian women do have to if you need to explain it or if you have to hear nasty remarks about you wanting to spend time with their own family then your whole life is kind of defined by that question and i said that i grew up with this feeling of disposition was not so much on account of experience but anticipated experience because like i say in the book that my mother didn't intend to kind of make me feel this way but sometimes it's just in the culture it's around you people will tell you aunts and uncles will tell you ki are when you go to your own house so somewhere at the back of your mind as a little girl you start to kind of question where your home is so you start to think 
this is not my home. I am expected to be somewhere else. So you kind of feel a little bit unhinged, a little bit off balance as if you shouldn't really be here. And then where should you be? So this feeling of dispossession comes at you from many directions. It comes from how your parents make you feel, from how your cultural environment makes you feel, from the larger public space not really wanting you there, just barely tolerating you, and other cultural elements as well. Just you being made to feel that you can't look a certain way or that you can't show your certain parts of yourself or that if you do, you are therefore more at risk and that you therefore invite attention that you don't want. All of these things cumulatively add up to this feeling of dispossession where you're never quite at home. You're never at home on the street. You're never at home in your parents' house. You're never at home in your husband's house. And you very rarely own your own property. So you actually, I think 90% of all women go through life feeling like they don't belong anywhere. In an attempt to answer these questions of where will I finally be home or where can I imagine a home, you tend to make a backwards journey. You go into the past and not just of your family, but also of different parts of the country and its politics. But when talking about Allahabad, a city that no longer exists, you say, I am nostalgic for its shadow future. Can you tell me a little bit about how home is connected, not just to the past, but also to the future? So Allahabad, or Ilahabad, like we say, the people who are from Allahabad will not say Allahabad, they'll say Ilahabad. It was not a place that I grew up in, but it's a place I could very easily have grown up in. There is one whole branch of the family there. It's a joint family. I have always found great affection there whenever I've visited. And because it is also my grandmother's maternal house, her Maika. So for her, it was her natal home. And I think she retained this kind of special affection for it and communicated that affection to me. And I've always found the city very interesting because even though my life there has always been very circumscribed, you went back there and a lot of the girls, particularly the younger girls, were often in Parda. And even if they did go to school and college, you couldn't just, you know, just take off and do whatever you felt like it in the city. But at the same time, it was an educational town. And if the university had been better maintained, if there wasn't that kind of or of violence around it, that unfortunately that had become its kind of reputation between the 70s and the 90s particularly. But if it had been actually a good university uh, where women were free to not only study, but in a cultural way, be embedded in it, grow in it, blossom in it, in that if my mother had felt that I could be sent there to study, if I had wanted to go there, if it had retained its sterling reputation, I think I would have liked to be there then. I would have liked to be a denizen of Irabad. I would have taken some joy in it, I feel. And all of this is speculative. It's what if this was possible. But I go there now and I look at it and I feel like if that had been an option for me, I think I would have felt a little more rooted in life because it's still part of the Eastern UP, that belt where my family comes from. I have cultural and family roots there. I would have found a certain intellectual life. I would have found a certain literary life there, which would have been different, say, from Delhi or Mumbai, but it would have been a kind of life. And I think about that life with, I can't say nostalgia because that's, nostalgia does not belong to me. It does belong to others. It, it might belong to a writer, say, like uh, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra. I was in Jaipur at the Literature Festival this year and I was reading some poetry. Arvind was also there in the same program. And this question of Allahabad came up at some point. Somebody asked him about his connection to it. And he said, I am a poet of Allahabad. A lot of my work is written about this place and is written from the place. And ever since they've renamed it, I don't write poetry anymore, is what he said. And of course, I mean, at that point, of course, he raised a laugh and everybody kind of was like, oh, look at what he's saying. But he obviously feels something for the place that I can never feel. And the writers who do belong to a city in that way, any city who inhabit the city in a way that they feel very strongly that their work comes out of it and that they belong to it and their work belongs to this place. I will never have that. 
and I think of Allahabad as the place where I could have had that. I think also that a f- the future is tied very much to our sense of home, as I say in the book, and I quote others also on it. Agha has written about it. Maya Angelou has written about it. Other lots of other writers have written about what home means, what belonging means, and it needs to be a place of safety. And your sense of future is also tied to safety. It needs to be a place where you think that now I can finally relax here. I can sleep here. I can rest here. I can imagine raising a family here. I can imagine doing things here, growing as as the city grows, uh, growing with it. But for that, you need a place that has a future, a place that has a place in it for you. It is very important. Any city that starts to reject you, any city that doesn't make place for people like you, not just you in a communal sense, but you in an intellectual sense. If it starts to shrivel in an intellectual sense and becomes narrow in the way that it doesn't allow new ideas, doesn't allow new people, doesn't allow old people, uh, doesn't allow certain ways of being, then that place effectively cannot offer you a future and therefore it cannot offer you a home. It can offer you nostalgia at most, but it cannot offer you a true home. Okay, I have one last question for you. And it's something I asked you four years ago, and I'm going to ask it again. And that's about why in so much of your work, you return to this idea of love and love in a completely uncynical and generous way. In this book, one of your definitions of home is the love that will not quit on us. So tell me, why love? And does it inevitably lead us home? Hmm. Why love? Because I don't think anybody can live without love. I think my life has been a certain kind of life in the sense that, you know, I didn't stay put in any one place. I did move around a bit. My mother also moved around a bit. My grandparents also moved. But even if I had remained in the same house, in the same village, where 14 generations have lived, even then, if that house had no love to offer me, I would not be at home there. I would not feel at home. Children run away from home, right? Children very often run away from home when they feel that there is no love for them or when they feel that love has been withdrawn. Even if it's been withdrawn for a very short period and parents don't understand that, of course, they love their children. Why would the children run away? But they run away because love has been withdrawn. And in that short time, that place, that physical place becomes unbearable. Nobody can exist without love. And even if you exist, it's a kind of existence and and you know that this is not what a good life feels like. And the moment anyone offers you love, you will reject everything else that comes associated with home, belonging, identity, even nation. People are willing to go against all of that if they are offered the prospect of true love or whatever you think of as true love, whatever you believe is love. And I think that is why people think of it as both dangerous and also are always longing for it, moving towards it. You will always move towards that point of love. Uh, Usually it is your own family, often your parents, often your children, often a spouse. But if these people do not offer you love, you will turn away from them. That place of love will become your inner location of home. That I have no doubt about. Other people can dispute it, but I think they're lying when they say that. Thank you so much, Annie. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Purna. And thank you, Pavan, also. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you for joining us on BIC Talks. Thank you for listening in till the end. Please share this episode with a friend on social media, WhatsApp, or anywhere else. It would mean the world to us. And in case you're listening via iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. Subscribe to BIC Talks on email or your favorite podcast app and don't miss out on future episodes. This episode of BIC Talks has Gaurav Krishna as our sound engineer with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Lekha Naidu. And the accompanying episode artwork was made by Chandni Venkataraman. Thank you for listening to this episode of BIC Talks. This podcast can be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org 
as well as on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Tune in for new episodes every week and do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages to stay informed on our latest updates. Thank you.